Good morning. My name is DeForest Everett Hillier, Jr. For most of my life, I've gone by D, just spell it D-E. When I was in fourth grade, I went out instead of up, and the kids said, you can't see the trees for DeForest. <laughs> Thus the name D. <laughs> I was born in El Paso, Texas at Fort Bliss, an Army base. My dad was stationed there and. 1943 when I was born. He went to Germany and Austria. My mom and I went to a small cotton town of Bostwick, located about 20 miles from Athens, Georgia. When my dad got back from Germany in 1945, we ended up in Staten Island, New York, where he was from. We lived there for about six months, then moved to New Jersey. We lived in all the Plainfields and Long Branch, and eventually settled in Springfield, about uh, seven miles from Newark, where my dad worked. He was with Swift and Company. He started out as a butcher, ended up the manager of the beef, lamb, and veal department. I went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas to go to a Methodist college. I dropped out of church totally. I think I went twice while I was there, and both times that was to try to impress a date. <laughs> I joined the Marine Corps in 1965 and ended up in Vietnam in 1968. But I came to Camp Lejeune here in North Carolina in 66 and was here for a year and a half before going overseas. <clears throat> I came back and spent another year and a half at Camp Lejeune. I extended for six months after my four years was up, thinking that I might stay in the Marine Corps and make a career of it. I had been encouraged to apply for uh, an officer position. And at that same time, in March of 1969, two months or one month after I got back from Vietnam, I felt called to ministry. The rest is history. I retired with 39 years of service in the church at Covenant United Methodist in Charlotte in 2008. In the last 13 years, this is my 11th interim. Most of them have been two, three, four months. So I look forward to being with you and sharing with you who I am and uh, what God has shared with me and hope that you will encourage others to come and be a part of the services. I realize that with COVID, many people do not feel comfortable coming. My wife and I have worshiped virtually for a good bit of this last year. Uh, we're just now starting to get back into the church, but I have had my shots. <laughs> so I am vaccinated, and I plan to get a booster shot when that's made available through the VA. But uh, I'm married to Bonnie. We have four children who range in age from 47 to almost 55. They're all in North Carolina. Three are in the or two are in the Charlotte area, one in Greensboro and one in Raleigh, Durham. Uh, he actually lives in Raleigh with his wife. But I look forward to being here and hope that you will uh, avail yourself of my presence while I'm here. If you need a pastor, call me or email me. My phone number and email are in the bulletin. I would ask if there are questions, but I think I better stop there, Ben. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm glad to be here, and you may have noticed my mask is tangled up with my hearing aids and my, my uh, headphones, so we'll work on that after the service is over. I'm reading this morning from Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 6, and I'm going to add two other sections from 1 Corinthians, both in the third chapter, verses 10 and 11, and verses 16 and 17, which kind of tie into what I'm reading from Hebrews. Therefore, brothers and sisters who are partners in the heavenly calling, think about Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him, just like Moses was faithful in God's house. But he deserves greater glory than Moses, in the same way that the builder of the house deserves more honor than the house itself. Every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant in order to affirm the things that, he, that would be spoken later. But Jesus was faithful over God's house as a son. We are his house if we hold on to the confidence and the pride that our hope gives us. Paul said, I laid a foundation like a wise master builder according to God's grace that was given to me but someone else is building on top of it. Each person needs to pay attention to the way they build on it. 
No one can lay any other foundation besides the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Don't you know that you are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you? If someone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person because God's temple is holy, which is what you are. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our world is, always has been, and always will be full of people who build. You don't have to look far to believe or understand this. We have contractors and subcontractors, remodelers, restorers, disaster renovation specialists, and the list goes on and on. I have always enjoyed building things. I was blessed as a child to have an erector set. I had Lincoln logs, and I also had wooden blocks, and I played with them regularly. But at Christmas time, I was always excited because we grew up living in apartments. People threw their Christmas trees away by the garbage house, which was a building attached to the garages. We would go out there. There were a bunch of us kids living in that neighborhood. We would take those Christmas trees, stand them up side by side, kind of link them together, and make a fort. Our fort had rooms in it. We had a roof. We loved to build with those Christmas trees. We lived in Long Branch, New Jersey, down the shore in uh, the Asbury Park region from 1953 to 1956. I remember going to the beach regularly with my mom. We walked every day the one mile from our apartment. I loved to play in the sand. We had a sandbox in the apartment, too. We would build castles together, and I noticed others around me building and tearing down and rebuilding. I'm still a builder. I built a sermon, so to speak, to come and bring to you this morning. I write a daily devotional for Facebook under the, the title, From the Hill, taking Hillier, my last name, From the Hill. Before I entered the ministry, however, I created objects. I did engraving and made nameplates. I did construction. I built printing press rollers. I also did sheet metal work, building ducks and installing them. I built a tennis, or not a tennis court, built multiple tennis courts for the city of Dallas in one of the summers while I was at SMU. That was a hard job, but we took great pride in what we did, seeing it come from the beginning of an empty lot to a tennis court with a, a chain link fence around it. Builders with unusual skills amaze me. Our youngest son is a woodworker. He got an architectural degree from UNC Charlotte and decided along the way he wanted to build furniture. He's working for a construction company in Charlotte now after having his own business for about 10 years and is building, and he loves it. They started a millwork department with him and his best friend. Some of the things that they build blow my mind, but it's amazing what you can do if you put your mind to it. My wife and I enjoy going to craft shows and touring model homes, visiting new buildings, seeing how things are put together. I'll always remember the first time I went into Duke Chapel. I walked in and just stood there with my mouth open, looking at the beauty of that sanctuary. I also remember the first time I saw the Empire State Building, and I stood there looking up at that and just wondering how in the world did people build something so tall that it stands up and people actually work in it. If you go to the beach, you will always see children playing in the sand, and even beyond that, you'll see adults building things. I saw in the news recently, you may have seen it also, an article about a man who builds sand structures for a living. He was building one for a golf tournament at the time, and if I remember correctly, he took 30 tons of sand, wet it down, and constructed this absolutely marvelous looking feature. Adults build. Have you ever seen the creations that are made with Legos? Maybe you've helped your grandchildren or your children build with them. We have. But then the Lego land in California, and there are eight in the world if you're interested in that. Within that California park is a place called Miniland, M-I-N-I -I land, 
Within it, you will find the White House, the Washington Monument, replicas of other U.S. landmarks made out of some 20 million Lego bricks. Some other landmarks that are created or have been created for this mini land are the city of New Orleans, New England, the California coast, and a replica of New York City. The White House alone is amazing. It's an exact 120th scale model of our actual White House in Washington, D.C. It's complete with a mini press corps, secret service men, and a heliport. The White House took 262 hours to build. It's composed of 32,000 Lego bricks. If you stop and think about it, we're never satisfied. We plan, we build, we remodel, we renovate, we add on, we tear down, and we rebuild. This is true with structures as well as with people. For we are concerned also with building character and building relationships. So the question this morning simply is this, what are you building with your life? What are we building together as the church of Jesus Christ? In Genesis 1-1, we read, in the beginning, God created. God was a dreamer, but God was also a builder, for he put feet on his dreams. God looked at everything that God had made, and God was very pleased. God's special creation, humans, created in God's likeness or image, were also builders. Early on, though, they decided to do some remodeling on their own. We see Cain killing his brother Abel, even at a worship moment. God's creation became evil, and God decided to wipe out human beings and start over again with the one person who did please him, named Noah. And guess what? Noah was a builder also. Noah built an ark, a boat, a large boat, and he sailed into a new age as the preserver of the human race, along with his family. He did, quote, all that the Lord commanded him, unquote, in the face of universal ridicule of his neighbors. But that's not the end of the story. In Genesis 11:4, the people of the world said, Let's build a city with a tower that reaches the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. They wanted to make the true God extinct and become little gods themselves. So God got on his bulldozer, so to speak, and scattered them all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. Next, we encounter a man named Abram who we know is Abraham, the friend of God. Repeatedly, God assured Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. He too was a builder, for we see that he made an altar. And on that altar up in the wilderness, he offered his son Isaac as an offering to God until the angel of the Lord came and stopped him. And God realized that Abraham truly was a person of faith, obedient to the point of being willing to kill his only son. There are so many other builders in the stories of our Bible. One of the greatest builders was Moses. He didn't build cities with stone, but he built a people and he forged a nation by being obedient to God even when it seemed ridiculous. In the final chapters of Exodus, we see repeatedly that Moses did exactly what he had been instructed, quote, just as the Lord had commanded him, unquote. We know that what God commanded Moses was very detailed and very difficult, but Moses took God at his word and was faithful in bringing it to fruition. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant. Jesus, however, was faithful as the son in charge of the house. The author tells us to think on, to consider, to fix our attention upon Jesus. In other words, continue thinking of Jesus, God's high priest, in such a way that you learn the lessons that God is trying to teach you. The word priest in Latin is pontifex, from which we get pontoon bridge. 
That's the root of that, of that term. Jesus is the one who, because he is a bridge builder, who knows both God and us, is the ideal one to be the pontifex for us, the bridge builder or the bridge. He's built the bridge not only between God and us, but between you and me, between all of us together in the church. Paul was a master builder, creating out of simple everyday people the very body of Christ. Jesus is the sure foundation, the cornerstone, the one and only foundation upon which we are to build. You and I are the Lego bricks, so to speak. We are the individual building blocks, and together we build and become his body, the church. So again, what are you building for God? Believing that the Holy Spirit lives in you? What kind of house are you preparing for God, not only within yourself, but within your community? What kind of kingdom are we building together? The word in the New Testament for carpenter in reference to Jesus is tectone, the Greek word that means craftsman. More and more evidence seems to suggest that Jesus' primary occupation was not necessarily that of a carpenter working with wood, which I'm sure he probably was, but also that he was a stonemason. Some 80% of all the building in Jesus' day was done with stone. It would make sense that he might work with that medium. Whether he created out of wood or stone doesn't matter, though. The fact remains that Jesus was a master craftsman. Most important of all, though, was the truth that Jesus is a priest, our priest, a pontifex, who is building bridges between all of God's people and God. In Revelation 21, we see God still building and creating a new heaven and a new earth. God says in Revelation, Behold, I make all things new. In order to do that, we need to be available to God and be good material in his hands. We must be concerned with building together on common projects. We must be willing to be connected to one another. We need to remember that we are not the foundation. Jesus is. I found it very interesting in the first service, I talked about a man named Bob Peeler. Bob lived in Meisenheimer, North Carolina, where Pfeiffer University is. I was pastoring a church in Richfield, two miles down the road, south of Meisenheimer. And we did a renovation, a major renovation of our fellowship building or Fellowship Hall, which was located in the basement of our educational wing. Bob Peeler was in charge of that reconstruction, did a marvelous job. I went over there one day and found Bob up on a ladder with a piece of crown molding, trying to make it fit, and it didn't fit to his satisfaction. So he came down off the ladder, took out his pocket knife and shaved off a little bit, got back up there and tried it again, and it just didn't seem right to him. So he walked out the door and threw it outside, a rather long piece of molding that was expensive. He got another piece of molding, cut it, and made sure that it fit perfectly. Guess what? In the first service, I met Bob Peeler's daughter. Small world, folks. <laughs> But Bob replaced that strip in order to do the very best work that he could do. Let us build Christ Church, Central United Methodist Church, the God, that God's kingdom on earth will appeal to many people and be a true representation of who God is. Leave from here today with the question in your mind, what am I building for God? And what are we building together here at Central? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.